I'm going to try it again when I'm not muted. <laughs> my name is Candace Savage, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Nature City Conversation on behalf of Wild About Saskatoon. Tanse, Egwa, Tawau, Natsia Kasson, Candace Savage, Kiwit no Kochinia, Maga, Nisaskotumanik, Megwatch in the weekend. Iwichi Hoyo Yana Notch, Wild About Saskatoon. It's an honor to speak these few words of Nehea Wewen as a small way of acknowledging that Wild About Saskatoon works on Treaty 6 territory and in the homeland of the Métis. Despite all the harms of colonization, indig Indigenous languages are still spoken and taught and shared among us, offering us all teachings about how to live on this land in a good way, seeking myo ayawen, health and prosperity for all. Tonight, we will be focusing on the health of the South Saskatchewan River with the guidance of three very special guests. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them in just a minute, and then I will turn the screen over to them each in turn. But before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge the behind the scenes support of Rachel McKenzie of Wild About Saskatoon and Amanda Farnell, our technical wizard of the Saskatchewan Festival of Words. Um, ordinarily in a, on another setting, you would not be hearing my dog bark, but this is real life. And I've, we have learned that if we try to keep them out of the room, they're even more outrageous than they will be tonight. So our three guests, we're so fortunate to have these three people with us for this discussion. Marjorie Bocage is a two-spirit Métis auntie, filmmaker, activist, and educator, a land protector and water walker. Born in Vassar, Manitoba, to a large Métis family, Marjorie's life work has been about creating social change, working to give people the tools for creating possibilities and right relations. She has been a grandmother for walking with our sisters, the elder for out Saskatoon, and the elder in residence for the University of Saskatchewan Student Union. Our second speaker, Robert Bob Halliday is Canadian by choice, but he tells us it was his parents' choice. Bob left Belize for Vancouver as a child and received most of his formal education there. He has practiced as a consulting engineer in Saskatoon for more than 20 years. He previously worked for Environment Canada and is a former director of Canada's National Hydrology Research Centre. He currently serves as Vice President of the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. And our third speaker will be Mary Culbertson, Saskatchewan's first woman treaty commissioner. She is of Nakaway and Irish Scottish English descent. A member of the Kisikus First Nation, she was the first member of that nation to earn a Juris Doctor from US U of S Law and to practice law in Saskatchewan. Since January of 2018, Mary Culbertson has been the Treaty Commissioner for Saskatchewan. So as you can see, we couldn't have better teachers for this discussion of the health of the river. And so Marjorie, I'm going to turn the screen over to you. Uh, thank you, Candice. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Tawal, Tanche. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I would like to <clears throat> begin by honoring the water, by singing the water song. It's been part of the song that we sing a lot on our water walk as, as we walk, and I'll talk about that later. So as I'm singing, I want you to think about if water could talk right now, 
what would she say? Mibe Giza Geiko Gimi Gwecho Wene Wigo Giza Wene Wigo Mibe Giza Geiko So no divier, our home, the home for very many with all its complexities and multitudes. So what makes this river that comes from the mountains to the sea? Is that the definition of a river? That's what the dictionary says. It flows from the mountains to the ocean. But it is the sacred waters of life that we honor on the earth. It's the lifeblood of Mother Earth. And she's suffering a lot right now. A lot. Uh, with the droughts and the floods and the fires and all the harm that we've caused her, we made this. Humans made this uh, trouble for Mother Earth. So how do we take care of these waters that are governed by Grandmother Moon and all the tides of life and all the waters of life are governed by Grandmother Moon. Our tears, our blood, the rivers, the, the oceans, the rain, everything is governed by Grandmother Moon to keep life flowing. And it's our responsibility to do that as women, especially to take care of the waters of life because we are life givers. And that's very uh, big uh, responsibility and a sacred, sacred gift and a trust that, that, that we have. Um, so how is it that, you know, we're treating water like an unlimited, you know, resource and that we're colonizing our rivers and this river with irrigation projects, with recreation um, needs and hydro dams. The river is not a checkbook. The river is uh, like it, when I, I get overwhelmed sometimes when I think about the way that we think about her and use her, uh, you know, and exploit her without thinking of it, the consequences of our actions. And so that's why three years ago, we started the water walk for our river to heal it. And the water walk is a ceremony and every step is a prayer because our prayers, our thoughts are powerful. When we say, water, we love you, water, we thank you, water, we respect you, 
the water changes, the water receives that energy that we give to her and it changes. There's even been a scientist, I forget if that Japanese scientist that has done, you know, uh, studies and has photographed crystals of water before and after it was loved. And the crystals of that water changed. That's how powerful we are with our, even our thoughts and prayers. You know, that we don't have to do big, huge actions. We can, every time we use water, we turn on the tap. Every time we take a bath, every time we walk by the river or a body of water, we say that to her and, and she'll respond. So um, that's part of the teachings. All nations have water teachings and responsibilities that we have towards the water. And the uh, focus is on keeping that water flowing and keeping that water clean. And so when we started that water walk three years ago at the headwaters uh, in northern um, in BC, just north, uh, in the north part of uh, uh, past the Alberta border where the river starts. Um, it was very, uh, we went to the actual, the very, very source and that water was coming out clear, crystal clear and beautiful. But the snow on the mountains was almost all gone already and this was just in June, end of June. And that's happening this year too. It's happening all the time. There's hardly any, and then the snow will melt too fast and then it creates floods and all of that. But when we started our walk, the bears were already, uh, the land was so dry, the bears had nothing to eat. The grizzly bears had their skin just hanging like like they were really, really unhealthy. And uh, there wasn't any berries for them. There wasn't all the things that they needed from the river. It was uh, really sad to see. And then as we came further and further down, it was the first year we walked all the way to the forks in P Prince Albert. We walked the whole Northern Saskatchewan River and the more we came down, the cloudier the water got and the messier it was. And there was drought. There were beaver ponds that were dry and dams were sitting like on the ground. There was no, the, there were so many things. When you're walking and you're present and in the moment, you feel it you feel it differently than if you're driving by or just, and, and every time we come to something, to animals or humans or uh, other water streams or dried out streams, we put down that tobacco as we walk to help it along. And even the humans that yell at us and tell us, what are you doing here? We, we put tobacco down for them too. And um, it's not a protest, it's a prayer. So we can't think bad things while we're carrying that water because from the time we pick it up and walk with her, we carry her to keep it flowing. The water never stops till the end of the day when we put it down, we touch it down and, and, and then we sleep and pick it up again in the morning. So all the time that we're walking, it flows all day and we carrying her, but in a way she's carrying me too. When I, I felt that connection to her, that I felt like I was being carried as much as I was carrying her. It was a, a really beautiful thing. And uh, and then the second year, last year, we started at the mouth of the South Saskatchewan River at Bow Island, where the Red Deer River and the Old Man River empty and to Bo, into Bow Island. And then the South Saskatchewan River starts there. And then we went through Southern Alberta and Southern Saskatchewan. And again, it was like 40 degrees and drought most of the time. 
we never had actually in the whole two years so far that we I've walked the river, we have not been rained on. The first the first year it was uh, like over four weeks we did I, we never got rained on. Last year we never got rained on at all. We didn't even see rain nearby. Like there was one thunderstorm far away uh, when we were uh, in Riverhurst, and that was the only time. And at Riverhurst, like seeing that they expanded the river to make it into a recreation area. I mean, it's lovely to have that, but at the same time, what did it do to the river? You know, and what did it do to the river? It was not meant to be that way. And uh, then this year, we're uh, starting the walk on June 17th, right on the other side, at the ferry crossing at Riverhurst, because it was just too hot and dry to continue last year, and we didn't have enough waters, uh, people to carry the water to make our destination back to the Forks and PA, where the two rivers join. So uh, we decided to, to end it there and pick it up there this year. And then when I was driving home from there last year, I went by that deep in Baker Dam and then through Dakota, uh, Whitecap Dakota Territory, and then in Saskatoon, and then we're going to my homelands, the Métis homelands in St. Louis and Batoche and Muscaday to, to the river again, to the forks. That's our route this year. It's a shorter route. If we have more people, we'll probably be able to do it in about two weeks. So I'm inviting you folks out there if you wanted, we'll be coming through Saskatoon. And uh, if you want to walk for a ways or be part of it in other ways. Well, we have a Facebook page, uh, 2023 South Saskatchewan River Water Walk, and uh, you can find us there and we'll be posting um, where we are each day. And you can come even for an hour or a whole day or as much as you want. And I'll just put out one other thing um, on, Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, we will be all stopping all day at the river in Saskatoon at um, the Gabriel Dumont Park from sunrise to sunset. I'll be making a sacred fire. We'll have a teepee and we'll be making water offerings all day. I'll be teaching people how to do that and uh, they can participate in that. They'll drop in and say hi, do whatever, but we'll be there from sunrise to sunset on uh, on that day. And a teaching kind of day, resting kind of day. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know what else to say right now. So I think I'll just pass it over to, to Robert and we can continue the conversation after. Thanks. Thank you, Marjorie. I'm going to use slides in my presentation and uh, I'm, I'll try to load these now and uh, hope it works, uh, but Amanda can bail me out if we have a problem. Not sure if that's visible or not. Um, can someone say if it is? <laughs> we can see it. Okay. Oh, that's super. Okay. Basically, what I'm going to talk about is the um, Lake Diefenbaker Irrigation Expansion Project that um, Marjorie mentioned. And um, I'll just make another adjustment here before I start. Yeah, hang on. step through a few slides and I uh, first of all I'll give a, a little overview of a Saskatchewan River Basin 
and I'll talk a little bit about water availability in the basin and then um, some work on environmental impacts and economic considerations vis-a-vis -vis irrigation. So let's uh, proceed on that basis. And first of all, um, as we, we, we all know, I think, that the Saskatchewan River Basin originates in the Rocky Mountains of Alberta and Montana. And uh, some of the things that we may not know are that about half that basin doesn't contribute to flow in a typical year. And uh, in fact, the North and South Saskatchewan River are just basically uh, water conveyance channels going across the prairies. Another thing that's largely unknown, although some of us know this, is that the Saskatchewan River Delta is the largest inland freshwater delta in North America. And um, it, for many years, if you checked the uh, Atlas of Alberta, it said that the Peace Athabasca Delta is the largest inland water delta in, in the world. And uh, uh, Saskatchewan River Delta is twice the size. So there, there's a little bit of exceptionalism going on there. And finally, the, the river does join Lake Winnipeg, which is the world's 11th largest lake. And from there, of course, the Nelson River flows to Hudson Bay. And I just wanted to show this non-contributing area because it's important to people that use water throughout the basin. If you're in the light yellow part of this picture, uh, you're depending basically on prairie runoff for your water supply. And uh, that's an ephemeral source that the quality is poor and uh, you're much more likely to have water stress. Whereas those people, depending on the North and South Saskatchewan rivers themselves, have a pretty reliable source of water that enables many, many water uses. And if we switch now to the South Saskatchewan River, as uh, Marjorie just said, the, it's almost entirely transformed by human activity. There are dams and reservoirs, diversions, um, all kinds of structures throughout the basin that change the flows and modify the flow regime. And of that water that flows down the river into Saskatchewan, only 2% of it originates in Saskatchewan. And um, geographers call these North and South Saskatchewan rivers exotic rivers, and that term comes from the River Nile. But uh, at any rate, uh, the, the flow that we drink in, uh, in Saskatoon when you open our taps is really mountain water. And that river basin also contains more than three quarters of Canada's irrigated agriculture, much of that in Alberta, but some of it in Saskatchewan as well. And just a little takeaway, the, uh, the livestock in the basin consume more water than people. And here's the effect of the that river regulation and modification that I mentioned. This is the flows at um, Saskatoon before and after Lake Diefenbaker and many of the upstream dams were constructed. And uh, you'll notice there's a very pronounced spring peak with a mountain runoff in June and July and very low flows in the winter. And with river regulation, we've actually clipped that peak considerably. And you can see uh, now the effect of spring runoff in the prairies in April and then another bump in June, July, but it's much lower than previously. And of course, the flip side of that is we have uh, much higher flows in the winter, partly due to the uh, release of water for uh, hydroelectric generation in the winter. But it means that uh, the uh, spring flushing flows that uh, sustain ecosystems and maintain repairing river structures are much reduced now with the river regulation. But on the flip side of it is that we have, because we have winter high flows, uh, that does assist in waste assimilation from towns and cities along the river. And if we turn now to water consumption in the South Saskatchewan River Basin, and I rush to say that means the water that we actually consume, not the water that we divert from the river. This is the, uh, a pie chart of the, the typical flow of the river. And under those typical conditions, uh, about a third of the water in the river is consumed by irrigated agriculture. And you can see other little slices of small water uses. And uh, I know most people will ask, what does other mean? And what, what is the other? 
and uh, that other it tends to be um, uh, various uh, lake regulation structures and so on and things like Ducks Unlimited uh, wildlife waterfall projects who divert water into a, an impoundment and then evaporate it throughout the course of the summer. So the, um, but irrigation is by far the biggest use. I should mention also that the diversions are a, a diversion to um, uh, down to Regina through the uh, uh, Buffalo Pound Lake and also the Seuss diversion from the east side of Lake Ethan Baker. And I, I did want to flag too that uh, the uh, water flows between the three Prairie Provinces are governed by the what's known as the Prairie Provinces Water Board Master Agreement on Apportionment. And under that agreement, Alberta consumption is is usually at least under normal conditions, much less than its entitlement. And uh, during very drought years, Alberta comes close to using its entitlement. Now, if we turn now to the irrigation project, uh, this has announced uh, a couple of years ago with the idea that uh, $4 billion would be expended to irrigate some 200,000 hectares over a period of 10 years. And uh, that, uh, announcement took place a couple of years ago and the project consists of three phases and phase one which is this area in sort of a light purple is just to the immediate west of Lake Diefenbaker and then phase two is extends that into a, a, a northward zone up towards the North Saskatchewan River and then phase three is down in the Capel system or between Lake Diefenbaker and uh, Buffalo Pound Lake. And thus far, um, provincial activity has been almost entirely confined to phases one and two, which, uh, and phase three is, uh, as you see by the numbers, is relatively small. And, and uh, there are a whole host of uh, public policy, environmental, and economic questions that can be asked about this project. And I guess the public policy question to me is, uh, if the province is going to spend uh, $4 billion to enhance uh, sustainability in the province, uh, what other options were considered and uh, how do they stack up against this project? And I, I think we know the answer to that. But So let's turn now to some of the things we need to consider from uh, in the environment and the econ economics of this project. Uh, first of all, the any assessment of a project has to consider the effects in the, what we think of as the donor waters, the waters from the South Saskatchewan River that contribute to the project and they are lost to the project through evaporation and uh, so on. And so that's that whole area from Lake Diefenbaker all the way to Hudson Bay. And what are the effects in that, in that zone of the river? And then we also need to consider the effects uh, of a diversion on the receiving waters that includes the irrigated areas, uh, streams rec receiving return flows from irrigation because not all irrigation water is used. Some of it is, uh, is does return to streams and rivers. And then finally, we, we need to consider the effects on the Capel River system as a whole. So there are a number of different environmental areas to, to take a look at. And so when we look to the donor waters, and these are the waters from Lake Ethan Baker to Hudson Bay. Uh, first of all, we have uh, decreased power generation at 10 existing hydro stations along the river. And there are also uh, four potential stations on this river as well, including one in Saskatchewan. And at the moment, the largest single economic benefit of Lake Ethan Baker and the dam at, at, at Gardner Dam is the value of the hydropower generated by the system. And so when we when we remove water from the river, we reduce the flow through the generators and therefore uh, there's a cost associated with that. There are also downstream effects on infrastructure, whether they're water intakes, ferry crossings, uh, any anybody that depends on being a living by the river uh, could have effects on on their infrastructure as, uh, as flows are reduced. And then we also need to affect, uh, look at um, 
effects on water quality if uh, return flows from the irrigated areas end up in the river. And, uh, you know, the other effects, things like the effect on riparian vegetation along the river, effects on the ice regime in the river. We Changes in the ice regime between Lake Deef and Baker down to Pike Lake, uh, you know, could lead to increased or changes in, in ice regime and, and maybe more ice jams and that sort of thing. And then finally, there are the effects on the Saskatchewan River Delta. Um, decreased water supplies tend to influence vegetation su succession and changes in vegetation lead to impacts on birds and fish and aquatic mammals. So there are any one of a number of potential effects on the donor waters of this project. Then if we look at the receiving waters, uh, you know, within the irrigation areas, uh, there'll be wetland loss because the, the landscape will be modified to uh, enhance uh, irrigated agriculture output. There are always issues with um, water table increases and salinization, potential increases in erosion. Uh, the, the movement of water for irrigation provides a, a conduit for invasive species to move around the province, and uh, that could be a challenge. And then just the virtue of the irrigated agriculture, uh, more nutrients and contaminants, pesticides, for example, would be used on that irrigated land. And we have to worry about the mobilization of those nutrients and contaminants and, and what the effect will be. And when we move down into phase three in the Capel Valley, we can consider all of those kind of losses and changes. But we also have communities in the valley and whether we're First Nations communities or other communities that are potentially affected by the change in the water regime along the Capel River. And I wanted to, this is a busy chart, but I think it's important to try to make my point on it. And uh, this is the annual naturalized flow of the South Saskatchewan River at the Alberta-Saskatchewan border. And by that, I mean, it's the flow that would have happened had there not been uh, water uses consuming water in the basin. So the effects of uh, irrigation water use in Alberta are taken out of this chart. And what I want you to note is where I've drawn that horizontal line, um, there, it's, it's sort of established a, almost a, a minimum flow in the river over a period of more than a hundred years. Uh, I'll just, and so you see a, a low flow time here in the in the 1930s, another one in the 1940s, another one in, another in the 40s, one in the 50s. You come along in 76, 84, 88, 84, and so on. And then we come to 19 or 2001, and after almost 100 years of a certain minimum flow, we find with the drought in 2001. The water flow in the, in the South Saskatchewan River was significantly less than that previous minimum that uh, shows through all those years. And my question really is, is that a, an indicator of climate change? Is it something we need to worry about? Or is it just truly an anomaly? And in order to kind of put your minds around some of these things, I'm going to throw a, a large bunch of numbers at you. And uh, I don't expect you to assimilate them all, but maybe you can get the scale of things. So the median annual flow in this river is about eight and a half million cubic decameters. A cubic decameter is a thousand meters cubed. So it just keeps us from writing another pair or another set of three zeros. And that low flow that I mentioned previously is about 5,000 cubic decameters. And of that, uh, Alberta shares approximately half Saskatchewan shares a quarter and Manitoba gets a quarter. But there's also a conservation flow in the river and that of, of um, 42 cubic meters per second, which annually amounts to this um, one, uh, this number here, 1,339,000 cubic decameters. So in the conservation flow is lower than either Saskatchewan or it's higher and either Saskatchewan share or Manitoba share. So that, that's a, a significant number in its own right. 
And then Lake Diefenbaker has a target release, which under normal conditions, it would be releasing this almost 2 million cubic decimeters of water from Lake Diefenbaker. And that number, as you see, is again is, uh, is, is significantly larger than these numbers for during low flow conditions. And then within Saskatchewan, the province has allocated 1.275 million cubic decimeters for various water uses, including including things like municipal use, uh, industrial use, the Ducks Unlimited projects, irrigation, and so on. And then this project that um, was being proposed would require about 600,000 cubic decimeters. So my, the takeaway from all of this is that um, uh, th this project will be a significant water consumer compared to uh, existing water uses. It will also um, be a significant water demand compared to minimum flows under drought conditions, which we talked about in the previous section up here. And so the end result and the takeaway from this is that uh, in my mind, uh, this project cannot be considered as a, as a drought proofing measure because during droughts, there just won't be enough water to run the project. But just at the moment, um, what I call basement flows, these are those very low flows occur about one year in 10. And under climate change scenarios that I've looked at, uh, by 2050, we, we would probably prudently consider droughts as occurring two years in 10. But even now, water allocations in the basin exceeds uh, Saskatchewan's share of the annual flow and the annual conservation flows at, at low flows. And so again, the, the uh, this project does little or nothing to deal with drought. And if we assume that uh, 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 over 10 years that an irrigation project will not have enough water two years in 10, and likely because of high flows, uh, there'll be two years in 10 when water from irrigation is not needed much. And so when we look at the economics of the project, we have to consider that uh, it's only going to be useful six years and 10. So that's uh, another takeaway from this in my mind. And I won't go into the uh, economics of the project in, in great detail. I um, suffice to say that uh, the, the stated economic benefits of the project, I, I say here are exuberant. They're, they're based on uh, a lot of value added uh, um, production of different agricultural projects. And, the, and the, all the projections that have been made thus far are based on outcomes in other jurisdictions like Alberta and the American Midwest and so on. And uh, none of the, those projections included the, the, the uh, negative economic impacts like uh, diminished uh, um, hydroelectric generation and uh, you know other losses that have to be mitigated uh, either environmental or other losses like that. And what I'd like to see to um, really get a good handle on the uh, economic impacts of this project would be to turn back to the 1980s expansion of irrigation in Saskatchewan, which spent about 250 million in today's dollars. And uh, I'd like to see an economic analysis of, of the economic benefits of that project from the 80s, you know, we're now 50 years later almost, and uh, benefits, if any, should have been realized. And that would be a useful exercise to either help us understand the economics, or in fact, uh, if the economics turn out to be uh, not as good as expected, it would be one reason to review the need for the project. So just in closing, I'd like to say that the uh, the proposed project raises many questions related to the environment, economics, and public policy. And there's certainly insufficient flow in the river to allow full operation in drought years. And really my plea in all of this is that what this project needs is a comprehensive environmental assessment. And uh, you know, that would um, include things like uh, uh, the impact, environmental impacts I've mentioned and uh, environmental impacts and other impacts on First Nations lands and uh, and things like the, um, the Saskatchewan River Delta. So that concludes my remarks and I'd like to turn it over now to Mary to carry on from here.
Oh, thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm seeing a different screen here, so it's confusing me a bit, but thank you so much um, for the segue and thank you to Marjorie for the beautiful prayer and song and your words and Bob for your information. Um, I'm not an expert on water, um, but what, what I am going to talk about is the current consultation that has been done or lack thereof and the current duty to consult projects or policy framework that is held by the government and kind of the failures of that around the Lake Diefenbaker project and other environmental impacts. So Anine, my name is Mary Muskwa Culbertson. I'm the Treaty Commissioner for Saskatchewan. I'm presenting to you today as I sit in my house in Treaty 6 territory in the city of Saskatoon. And I am originally from Kizikus First Nation in Treaty 4. And uh, so, well, we always hear a lot about lack of consultation, lack of consultation. And the general public probably, you know, well, I've seen the comments, I won't beat around the bush. You know, when you're reading an article like, oh, these Indians are complaining again, oh, they're never happy. Um, but it's a lot about the land, the water, the effects of it, being left out of decision making or completely ignored. And especially on the Lake Diefenbaker project, um, I was reading some past correspondence about it. And when the First Nations, um, the FSIN requested to the minister, the federal minister, they requested a full environmental impact be done. And they were told um, by the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada that at that point, phases one and two did not need um, any more investigation or to designate the project um, to be reviewed by Environment Canada or the IAAC, sorry, the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada. So they asked for um, a designation by the minister so they could have this project reviewed at the federal level. Their fear was it would just keep proceeding throughout the provincial levels where they already experienced very poor consultation. Um, it leans in favor of proponents and provincial departments, right? If one of those departments wants to get something through, they're going to find a way to, to do it. Um, there's minimal to no access to financial resources for First Nations to respond to proponent letters of notice or department letters of notice. And it leads to that loss of decision making, um, the loss of information, and a lot of times impacts to the environment and economic benefits. So a First Nation, for example, can get a notice about um, one of the piece, a piece of crown land being turned into provincial park, for example. And there's a lot of lack of capacity at a First Nations level. Um, a lot of times there, there is no duty to consult offices. There's only one First Nation that I know of that has an entire duty to consult office. Other First Nations don't. They struggle to, you know, keep, keep their heads above water, especially dealing with the everyday reality that's poverty, um, intergenerational trauma, and, and running their nation and everything that comes with it. So sometimes these these don't get any attention. They don't they they might fall off a fax machine and that's a very true story. And they'll claim they've never had any consultation about these projects. But the province just will send a letter. They don't send an email. They won't make a phone call. Nothing like that. And they just wait for no response so they can proceed after 30 days. And even if you do have the capacity to respond and people on on those consultation letters that come by way of regular mail um who has the time to be able to turn around that quickly hire somebody who can assess that project environmental impacts um legal responses there there isn't time 30 days 
right? Just to, we're going to start looking at this. We're going to start issuing licenses or permits. Um, there's no notification that's adequate. Um, not only is it a loss of benefit to First Nations, estimated in the hundreds of millions of dollars when projects um, just go ahead on their own traditional lands beside them. Um, the current duty to consult policy and political strategy to isolate First Nations from participating in the management of their own treaty territory and lands, water and resources, well, that's been working pretty well. There's very few First Nations that have that capacity to have a team respond or a department or someone even working in that area. So they're very tight about the consultation that they have done with each, each nation. If there was nothing to hide, they'd be wide open about all the consultation records, but they're not. They'll, there's even First Nations who have next door neighbors, another nation where they have to sign a non-disclosure agreement about consultation on projects or with industry and proponents. So when we have such lack of controls, being complete ignoring of any First Nations and Indigenous involvement, we know there's going to be gaps, right? The economy is the priority here where we live, right? We see that right now, pushing back um, emissions goals to 2050. Like, that's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, it's There's very few people who are really educating about the environment, the environmental impacts of these projects. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to hear from experts like Bill and Marjorie and be involved in this conversation. And I hope so many people get to watch it and at least, you know, have that um, spark of wanting to know more, to educate more. Because if they're not you know, consultating properly with First Nations, there's no consultation policy for, for the rest of the people who live here in Saskatchewan. So if they're not even doing their Supreme Court of Canada mandated consultation that they designed a policy around that's lacking, they have no obligation to report to their public, which they're not, right? So everybody should be concerned when First Nations say, we did not have consultation on this. So if they're not getting any information, that means the general public's not getting any information. So all the citizens in Saskatchewan should be very concerned, not just First Nations and Indigenous people. Everyone should be concerned because there's things going on with their lands, their environment, their water that they don't know about. When the oil spill, Husky oil spill happened in 2016, um, the impacts were horrendous, right? Seeing it, visually seeing it and being there on the site of entry of the oil into the river. I, I had the opportunity to go and do a personal site tour at that time. I was working intergovernmental affairs and providing some legal advice and it, it made me cry. And the smell of that oil, you, know, you couldn't even breathe and you could just see it. It was it was heartbreaking. It was it was horrendous. And Alberta uh, has better environmental policies than Saskatchewan, right? And that's a bare minimum. So when we do hear First Nations talking about consultation and these things that impact them, we we need to pay attention and put any other views and stereotypes and prejudices aside because somebody's calling the alarm here, right? And I was just reading over correspondence earlier today and it was from Vice Chief Heather Bear to the federal government. And it was about the Lake Diefenbaker Irrigation Expansion Project. And it was a couple of years of correspondence back and forth saying you, you have to do something at the federal level and about decisions not to designate the rehabilitation project phase one and expansion project phase two of Lake Diefenbaker irrigation under section 91, 9.1 of the Inv Impact Assessment Act. And so the minister responded that it didn't trigger enough. And there was an analysis in there that said, 
It reviewed the advice contained in the impact assessment agency's report and the rationale behind the minister's decision. It explains why First Nations had serious concerns about the interpretation of the evidence on record and minister's decision and the concerns of the consequences of not designating the project on the environment, public health and safety and indigenous rights in the province of Saskatchewan. Further downstream in the Saskatchewan River system from the Lake Diefenbaker Irrigation Project. So there is much to consider and I think this should just be a start of one of those conversations. Um, if people who are listening tonight, um, if this is their first time um, listening about the water and the health and safety of the Saskatchewan River, then those of us who are new to these conversations, um, we need to keep learning um, about you know, the involvement of the Saskatchewan Water Security Agency, about Lake Diefenbaker um, project, phase one and phase two, and phase three. Even though the Copal South Water Conveyance Project is phase three and it looks very small, um, you know, that is the part that could actually trigger um, a federal assessment. <clears throat> so future water security, um, food security, it's going to be loss of lands, loss of food security, loss of native habitats. Um, we're already seeing effects from climate change, right? And our, our water is not being paid attention to like it should. Um, we have to look at what's happening in the world around us, um, in the global environment, right? Climate change is affecting everywhere. Where is the biggest country and in, in continent in this world that has the most water? It's us. So we definitely need to need, know more. We need to educate each other more. And I'm really happy that I was to be able to be part of this conversation. Um, so the province's duty to consult policy um, it is very weak. It was under review. They did their own engagements and their own dialogue about revamping and redoing the duty to consult policy framework. And that was completed, but we have not seen any report or any compilation of it. Um, and we keep pushing for appropriate consultation because I see that being the biggest impact when you don't know what's going on with your lands, your waters, and the selling off of crown lands as well. We should all be concerned when they're selling off the land that we're all supposed to be sharing. So I will wrap up there. Please go and learn more about the, the very failures of consultation. There's many Supreme Court decisions. Um, the consultation policy framework by FNMR in Saskatchewan government. Um, it's available online. Um, I could send this to the organizers and they could send this out, um, the consultation policy framework. And this rehabilitation and expansion project, even though they're in the conceptual and early planning stages, now is about a year ago, um, they've been aggressively moving under those stages, but the project has continued to keep going forward. And there's relatively little information uh, about it out there. And it has not been released publicly, I think, by the Watershed Agency. And the project development and planning just continues on without any meaningful consultation or consultation and agreement at all with First Nations. And when they do say they're consulting, um, all these First Nations are saying, well, who? Who? You might go pick two or three and say, oh, we're consulting with them. Um, that's not consultation. Free prior and informed consent means everyone should be being educated. Everyone should be being consulted when it comes to these projects. And the province has a real aversion to accepting that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is being put into an act. Um, they, they think that it's going to somehow impact their economic wealth and their growth. Um, and so it really comes down to my, my vision is it, it's just about the money. It's always about the money. Um, I feel like we have governments who just don't care enough about the environment. And I welcome all the advocacy we can muster 
Um, and I, I hope to go walk with Marjorie a little bit this year in her water walk because that takes such courage um, to keep that going and, and be a leader doing that. So I'll wrap that up there. Um, you can go to our website and see all kinds of opportunities for information and learning. It's www.otc.ca. I feel so cheesy when I say that. I feel like I'm like promoting a, some shopping channel or something, but we do have a lot of really good information there. Mm -hmm. And something that's gonna happen next week, it'll be released very soon. Um, it's going to be, there's a declaration sign that's stating the week of May 21st um, every year is going to be Trudy's Recognition Week here in Saskatchewan. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so that'll be announced, and I, I forget to tell people about it the last few days. It's just been a really busy week, um, and yeah, where it's going to be a Treaties Recognition Week, so there's going to be education opportunities online, and even though it's the first year, it's kind of a soft start, um, but it's an entire week where we can talk about various issues, and specifically, we should be targeting you know, the impacts to treaty rights, inherent rights, and Indigenous rights, and all our rights when it comes to the water safety of that water and the environment right and the effects what we're seeing with climate change and there has not been a forum on the lake Diefen baker project and i think that people need to call for that forum and maybe we need to establish that just ourselves and invite government people on both levels and proponents to come and share information and have a q a so the public is informed so with that, I'll end. And again, miigwech, everyone, and thank you very much. As long as the rivers flow, they forget. <laughs> and the, the duty to consult for the government here seems to be the duty to consult corporations. I wonder if we would be able to get their, that file of how much consultations they've done with their business partners to develop these big projects and who how they how long they have more than 30 days to respond i'm sure oh it's probably very regular <laughs> yeah every day on the golf course no. <laughs> <laughs> amanda are you able to um make all of our speakers visible to the world Here we all are. Um, I do not know if um, there are any questions from the audience, but I'm feeling quite heartsick uh, myself right now. Um, and Mary, you have given us already some ideas about what we can do. I mean, learn is one thing and demand more information. Um, I would like to hear from all of you what kind of, well, Marjorie, what kind of support do you need for the river walk? If you could say more about that. Bob, can you imagine ways that we could demand this environmental, the environmental assessment that should be happening? It sounds to me like that by dividing this project up into, to, um, into phases that somehow it's been possible to make each part of it small enough that it doesn't trigger the kind of assessment it should have. How can we mobilize any kind of public input? Who wants this to happen so badly when it seems to make so little sense? I will be quiet now and wait for wisdom. Just just on the environmental assessment matter, um, one of the strange things about this project is that uh, the province has had consultants working on the project now for a couple of years, and um, and I'm sure they've submitted reports to the province, uh, none of which have become become public. And um, when we approached the uh, federal environmental impact agency. They said they, they would, couldn't comment or take part until there was a specific project proposal. And because none of these project reports have been done by consultants have been made public, at the moment, there is no specific project proposal. And so to me, that's the, the hook for eventually trying to get a 
an environmental assessment for the project at some point surely they have to say here's what we intend to do and once they say that then i think that's grist for uh, an environmental assessment mill there's just another little tidbit i could mention is that phase one could easily be explained as uh, simply a, an extension of existing work but phase one also includes uh, severely expanding the uh, so-called west side canal in order to enable phase two so to my way of thinking uh, that argument that phase one is just um, simply a bit of housekeeping doesn't hold up if it includes a canal expansion so something else to keep an eye on anyway is this an issue that the Saskatchewan Environmental Society will continue to follow? Yes, it will, yeah. Okay, it so will. SES, we can keep our eyes on SES and support SES as mm -hmm. one way of yeah. Act, acting? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I can't for a minute think that um, the impacts of this project on the Saskatchewan Delta aren't clearly related to impacts on First Nations peoples. Yeah. And therefore, the federal government at some point will have to step up. Well, this week, um, it was announced that Gary Carrier is being given a honorary doctorate of science degree by the University of Saskatchewan for his advocacy um, for the Delta and and all the teaching that he has done about how important that area is to indigenous cultures and economies and yet as you say there's not been any oversight any intervention to protect that all that value we can't hear you marjorie yeah i was just thinking you know, if it's Treaty Week, um, that maybe the advocacy <clears throat> should be towards uh, that right now to uh, okay. amplify. The government of Saskatchewan does not do anything relating to First Nations because they think it's not their responsibility, it's a federal responsibility. That's what I keep hearing. And and so they don't, you know, they don't care what happens to First Nations here and they don't feel that it's their responsibility. And I don't know, uh, down south in, uh, you know, with the around where the irrigation projects are that we walk by. Uh, people really don't care about that either because they were like, they own, they feel like they own the land and the water and, and like they can use that river to feed their animals and to water their crops and they can just take and take and take and they don't give anything back. I mean, over and over again, they were like, I mean, even when we, they asked us, what are you doing here? Um, and we told them, well, the river is over there. Like, uh, why don't you walk over there? Like we're on a grid road to avoid, you know, being on busy highways or whatever. And as close to the river as we can be, they don't own those roads, but they think it's their road because it's by their land and their farm. And like we're, practically like trespassers to them. It was a little bit disconcerting because they, they, they don't they say, well, it's a drought, you know, we're praying for you and your lands and animals and, and uh, farms. And uh, they said, well, we got the river. We can just pipe up the water now, you know, with these projects. And, but that river water is going down too because of the drought. I, you know, like it, it, they don't connect the dots and it's very short term, but they can get off of it today. So I don't know who is in a position to have any power over this. It's not, the farmers don't seem to care and uh, First Nations are not considered worthy of care. So like who's left?
Well, as a person who has the water of that river running through my my veins, I may not have much influence, but I certainly have a huge stake in the health of that river. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people have to start to see that more and more and and uh, stand up, stand up for that because it's not going to be there forever. And we keep getting all these messages like right now with the fires and the smokes and the floods. I mean, we're getting huge smudges from Mother Earth, you know, mm -hmm. that that uh, there's some cleaning up to do. And like this is the third year. This is the third year in a row that that's happening and we're still not getting it. It's like, what will it take? What will it take for people to understand that it doesn't last forever and they can't just keep taking and not giving back? Like, I ask myself that. I mean, I was an activist. I was in the streets most of my life, you know, until the last 10 years or so. But uh, I still, I've shifted my, my energy towards what I'm doing now. But... Uh, what does it take to move people to that sense of reciprocity and that sense of justice? Like, what does it take? Is that, that's the question, you know? Well, I think here tonight, we've all heard a call. Mm. Yeah, we've all heard a call from the river, from all of your experience and your expertise. Mary has invited us to look at the OTC website for some more information and to be alert to calls for action. We know from Bob that support for the Saskatchewan Environmental Society um, is one way of acting. You have given us, Marjorie, the um, coordinates for your 2023 South Saskatchewan River Water Walk, um, which we can connect with on social media. So yeah, you can feed us along the way. <laughs> we need if you're around, they get some food or sustenance. Yeah, Without gas money for the support vehicle. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a and well, yeah, so help to keep that water flowing and giving it some good energy so that maybe it will uh, be able to teach us more what we need to learn because the water is a teacher too. So when you're with her, she, she helps you to understand all that interconnectedness. And, and that's important that we realize that we are all related and that we're all connected. It feels to me like that's a good place for this conversation, this, mm -hmm. this iteration of this conversation to end with, with that realization. So I want to thank you all very much. Mary Culbertson, Treaty Commissioner, Bob Halliday, hydrologist and vice president of the Saskatchewan Environmental Society and Marjorie Bocage, elder and author and water walker. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. And um, as my little pitch, please, please do go and find Wild About Saskatoon um, on our website um, under our name, Wild About Saskatoon. We will have an event coming up on the 10th of June, a tour in some of um, the native plant gardens in Saskatoon. So we hope to see you there. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Good night. Good night, Take everyone. Care. Take care.